So uh, today we're going to look at the review for Chapter 6. Um, and there's a lot of stuff in here. And we've looked. I mean, I've intentionally spent some time all last week reviewing some of these topics from the beginning of the chapter already. Uh, so that'll help. Yes. No. Because <laughs> I want to do it now. So... Let's just go over this. Um, the first few problems are pretty straightforward. I mean, this first one, find A, D, and A, C. This is the one there. It's kind of like the freebie warm-up. You better get this right type problem. How long is A, D going to be? 20. To find A, C, literally, we have to do addition. 16.8. I do. I do. I have ridiculously high expectations. Get used to it. Okay. And by the way, you don't need your phones, your computers, or anything else. Right so keep them away. Okay. Um, for this one, UTW, a little bit trickier. I mean, it's a little more. This is a little more work because we got the algebra expression. So what are we going to do? This first solve for x. Is this indeed an angle bisector? Yes, because the point V is equally distant from both sides. And if uh, any point on the angle bisector is equally distant from both sides and the point is equally distant from both sides, it lies on the angle bisector. That's the converse. So I can say that 2x plus 3 equals 5x minus 24. And then we do the math. I get 27 equals 3x, so x equals 9. Are we done? No. And I, this is where you've been seeing a lot of people kind of mess up lately. I've seen this a lot on quizzes. Uh, people find the value of x and they move on, which is fine if the question says find the value of x. But if it, here it says find the measure of angle UTW. So... In order to do that, I'm going to have to find UTV and WTV and add them together. So that's 2 times 9 plus 3, which is 18 plus 3, or 21. And 5 times 9 minus 24, which is 45, minus 24, which is, sorry, 21. Now, that's a check to make sure I've got X right, isn't it? Because both angles wind up being the same, which is appropriate. And so the total measure of angle UTW is 42 degrees. 21 and 21, 42. <clears throat> okay. So there's my 42 and we're set. So it's a little bit of, it's a little bit extra there. Okay. Not, still not difficult, something we've done all year. But again, answer the question that's asked. It doesn't mean you don't have to find X first. But when you're done, make sure your final answer matches the question. Find the circumcenter of the triangle with the given vertices. Now, this is really going to be, from a graphing standpoint, this is going to be very simple. The real question that's being challenged here is, do you know how to find a circumcenter? What is a circumcenter? Where what segments intersect? Which special segments, angle bisectors, perpendicular bisectors, medians, altitudes, intersect to form a circumcenter? Yeah. Nope. Sorry, that's the centroid. Angle bisectors is the in center. Perpendicular bisectors. Okay. It's the perpendicular bisectors. And that's something from the first half of the chapter. We talked about this. We reviewed this on Friday as well as a couple times last week. We draw the circle, you know. So my points are at negative 1, 4, 5, 0, and negative 1, 0. Now, it is intentionally set up to be a nice, simple triangle to work with because if I know it's perpendicular bisectors, it's going to be really easy to find. I'm going to have to find what to get to perpendicular bisectors. I start by finding the... Nope, not slope. Midpoint of each side, because it's a bisector, it has to go through the midpoint. Now, 
again, these are fairly straightforward because they're horizontal and vertical sides. So my midpoint, obviously here, since that's four units long, is two units down, is right there. And this, since it's six units long, the midpoint has to be three units across halfway. They're horizontal and vertical segments. They don't require a lot of math, do they? If I want to do the midpoint of the diagonal segment, then I would have to do some math. But I got those two. That should be enough. And finding slopes, I don't have to worry about slopes with horizontal and vertical either because perpendicular is really easy with horizontal and vertical. Right? So I can draw in this perpendicular bisector and this perpendicular bisector. And where do they intersect? Right there at the point 2, 2. And it's really obvious. That is exactly my circuit center. That's all you need to do. I mean, it's set up, if you understand what a circuit center is, the problem is very simple and designed to be very simple for right here. It's not, it's not designed that you should have to do a lot of calculations and stuff like that. It's mainly graphing and interpreting. And there we are. I found my circumcenter, 2-2. Two, two. Balance point for a triangle, which is the centroid, which is where the what's intersect. Medians, there we go. Medians intersect the centroid. And centroid is super easy. I don't need to graph it, do I? Remember, it's the centroid is the one that's the average. So the average of the three x coordinates. So my x coordinates are 1, 5, and 3. So 1 plus 5 plus 3. And it says I'm averaging three numbers that goes over 3. And for the y coordinates, it's 5 plus 2 plus negative 3. I'm sorry, 5 plus 2 plus negative 1 over 3. Now, 1 plus 5 plus 3 nine over is 9. 9 over 3 is 3. 5 plus 2 is negative 1 is 6. 6 over 3 is 2. It says my centroid should be at 3, 2. Now, I may want to use the graph to check my answer, just to make sure it's reasonable. So A is at 1, 5. B is at 5, 2. C is at 3, negative 1. So there's my triangle approximately. And it's saying the centroid is at 3, 2. That makes sense. Call it N for centroid. Okay? That makes sense, doesn't it? It's inside the triangle. It's right where we think it should be, isn't it? It's a reasonable spot for it. It's not outside the triangle. If you came up with a point that's outside the triangle, you've made a mistake. So again, the centroid is kind of like the m version of the midpoint. Midpoint is for a segment. Centroid's for a triangle. Both are averages of the x's and averages of the y's. For midpoint, we add two numbers and divide by two because there are two, two values. For centroid, we add three numbers and divide by three because there are three numbers but they're both addition and then division. All right. Oh, excuse me. So there we go. Um, G is a centroid. And we give you some measurements. We have to figure out the remaining measurements. Uh, let's see what we got. We got AG is 10. We got FG is 2. We got BE, the whole thing is 12. We'll deal with that in a second. All right. Now, we have to remember what a centroid does. The centroid, right here, the idea is that point divides each median into one segment that's two thirds of the whole thing and one segment that's one third the length of the whole thing. Or I've got a long part and a short part. The long part is twice as long as the short part. And the short part is one third of the whole thing. Okay, so if AG is 10, how long is GD? GD must be 5. And AD is very easily then 15. 
if G, if F's G is two, how long is GCF to be? Four. Long part's twice the length of short. And so CF is two plus four or six. Now here's the tricky one. Uh, BE is 12. So how long is GE going to be the short part? Four, one third of 12, which means this is eight. And four plus eight is 12. Okay, so again, not really difficult, but definitely checking one of our theorems on centroids. See if that's necessary. Yeah, go somewhere. Okay, hold on. Did she? Okay. All right. Let's look at this one now. Uh, UW is three. How long does LN have to be? Now these are mid segments, right? Mid segments are ones that connect the midpoints. It's from the second half. And we know that UW is parallel to LN. And what do we know about the relationship of the length? This is three, this has to be six. Okay, that's an easy one says if uv is 2y plus 14 and mn is 13 minus y, that's the whole thing, how are we going to set that one up? Okay. Yep, 2 times 2y plus 14 equals 13 minus y. All right, so that's 4y plus 28 equals 13 minus y. Uh, add a y to each side, subtract a 28. I get 5y equals negative 15, so y equals negative 3. Is that a problem? Is y being negative a problem? Well, a length can't be negative. Could the value of y be negative? Yes, it could be. That's okay. Because 13 minus negative 3 makes this whole side how long? 16. So it's minus a negative. 13 minus negative 3. Okay, minus a negative is plus. So if this whole side is 16, how long is uh, wn? It's 8 and 8, right? Terrible eights. This happens. I try to write backwards. All right. All right. Um, this is the one that takes some time, and it's definitely going to be on the test. And you can bet that this is worth quite a few points because there's a lot of parts to this problem. Okay. We're used to a problem having just one part and then it's worth like you know one problem's worth of points this is going to probably be worth like three problem like triple a normal problem because there's so much work that needs to be done here and we have to do all the stuff we have to find midpoints slopes and distances so we got everything going on here so obviously the first one says find the midpoint of a b and label it f So I got to find the midpoint of AB. That's the first thing I have to find, right? What formula would you use to find the midpoint? Maybe the midpoint formula, right? Kind of obvious. So uh, I need to find my coordinates. A is at negative five, uh, three. B is at one, one. 
and C is at negative 3, negative 5. Okay. So to find the midpoint of AB, we do our midpoint formula. I'm sorry, it's, I'd say 5, 3, my, my negative 5, 3 there. There we go. So it's negative 5 plus 1 over 2 and 3 plus 1 over 2. Those are my coordinates. So it's negative 4 over 2, which is negative 2, and 4 over 2, which is 2. So negative 2, 2 is my midpoint. We're going to label that M. Next, we do the same thing for AC. So it's negative 5 plus negative 3, or negative 3 plus negative 5, and negative 5 plus 3. Say five, I write three over two. There we go. So it's negative eight over two is negative four, and negative two over two is negative one. So negative four, negative one, there's my second midpoint. I'm going to name it M. So I found my two midpoints. And yes, you'll need the specific coordinates, and you need to show your work. Next, I need to find that the Mid-segment MN and side BC are parallel. How do we show a parallel? What calculation do we do to show a parallel? We don't have a parallel formula. I have a slope formula. We use slope. Distance does not show parallel. Distance shows congruence or length, if necessary. Slope shows where the lines are parallel or perpendicular. So let's show what we find. Label what we're finding like you're writing it for an idiot. Um, slope of MN equals, oh, by the way, N I said was at uh, negative 4, negative 1. There we go. Okay. The slope of MN, slope is changing Y over change in X, so 2 minus negative 1 over negative 2 minus negative 4. Sorry, I don't need a comma there. That's 2 plus 1 is 3. Negative 2 plus 4 is 2, so slope of that line is 3 halves. 3 over 2. Then we find the slope of BC. Slope of BC, uh, 1 minus negative 5 over 1 minus negative 3. Minus negative becomes plus positive, so that's 6 over 4, which reduces to 3 over 2. So we have the same slope. So parallel lines. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Cole, it's for you. Good day. Okay, finally, show that MN equals 2BC. What do we have to do for that one? Distance formula. So MN, always label what it is you're finding. MN would be uh, negative 2 minus negative 4 squared plus uh, the Ys are negative 1 and 2. So that's the square root of 2 squared plus negative 3 squared, which is the square root of 4, plus 9, which is the square root of 13. Now, be careful here. Here's where we still get people making mistakes. Uh, square root of 4 plus square root of 9. The square root of 4 plus 9 is not the same as square root of 4 plus square root of 9. It's not 2 plus 3. This is not 5. It's the square root of 13. So watch your algebra there. Second one, BC. Again, another distance formula. The x coordinates are 1 and negative 3. The y coordinates are 1 and negative 5. That's the square root of 4 squared plus 6 squared. That's 16 plus 36 is the square root of 52. 
Now the question is, is the square root of 52 twice as much as the square root of 13? And by simplification, we can get that pretty easily. The square root of 52 is the square root of 4 times the square root of 13, so 2 root 13. And yes, we can't split it up in addition, but we can split it up in multiplication with the square root. Okay? Call they probably want you now, so. So yes, I just verified this is exactly twice as much. Now, if you're really stuck on this simplification, if you decimalize both of them and show me that one is twice as much as the other, I'd probably be okay with that. Okay? But this is better. This is a better way of doing it. So you're going to have to use midpoint distance and slope formulas. Each one twice on that problem. You got to know which one to use when. And by the way, not going to lie, when I'm grading this test uh, tomorrow night and into Tuesday or into Wednesday, I'm going to be looking very closely at how you do on that particular problem as part of my determining factor of what my recommendation is going to be for my math classes next year. If you can't demonstrate to me proficiency in something we've been working on from an algebra standpoint, like midpoint distance and slope formulas, I'm going to have a hard time saying that, yeah, you're all ready for Algebra 2 if you, if you can't do those simple formulas. Okay? I'm going to be really checking your algebra here. Are you ready? Uh, can I make a triangle? Three, four, five. Yes or no? That's a yes. Because 3 plus 4 is bigger than 5. Okay? How about 5, 6, 11? No. Why not? 5 plus 6 only equals 11. It's not greater than. The sum of the two smaller ones has to be greater than the largest. Equal is not good enough. Find the range of values for the missing side. X has to be between 3 and 17, yes. The difference, 10 minus 7 is 3, the sum, 10 plus 7 is 17. Pretty straightforward. Those are pretty easy. Okay. Um, list from smallest to largest. Again, this should be fairly easy. What's the smallest angle going to be here? Okay. What's the shortest side? This is the shortest side, right? So the smallest angle has to be across from it. So angle C has to be the smallest. Okay. This is the next largest side. So across from that has to be the next largest angle. And then, obviously, angle B, because that's 90. That has to be the biggest angle. Uh, how about here? The, si the angles are given, well, two of the three. The third one we could quickly get is 113. Okay. What does the shortest side have to be? And it should be fairly obvious. QS is the shortest. Okay. What's the next longest side? QR. And the longest side is RS. Remember, we're, if you're naming an angle, you need an angle symbol. If you're naming a side, you need a segment symbol. It's been that way since Chapter 1. So please remember to use your symbols properly. Which one's bigger, KL or MN? Or are they equal? MN is clearly larger, isn't it? Because it's obvious. It's pretty obvious the 35 degree angle is way bigger than the 19 degree angle, so this side has to be the longer side, okay? Because you have side angle side going on there, but the angles are different, so the third sides have to be different. This last one is, again, fairly simple, but it's one that trips a lot of people up because we're used to writing equations, not inequalities. Okay, equations have an equal sign and inequality has an inequality sign. Okay, so, and I even did it first hour when I was going over the review. Halfway through the problem, I switched my greater than less than sign into an equal sign. You've got to be careful. It's really easy to do it because we're so used to writing that equal sign. Okay, so what's this inequality going to be? We've got an x plus 7. I got 2x minus 3. Which one has to be bigger? 
the 2x minus 3 has to be bigger. We now have to solve it. Now, solving inequality is just like solving equation, except if we divide through by a negative number, right? Then I have to flip the inequality. So I'm going to make sure my coefficient of x stays positive, so I'm going to do this. And I get 10 is less than x. And that's good. We're all done. Now, if you want to write it so the x comes first, that's fine. It's just you have to remember that when I switch the x over here, the alligator is still leading the x, right? Because the x is the bigger one. So if you want to put the x first, that's fine. You don't have to. This would be a perfectly good answer right here. Same here. Uh, which has to be bigger, the 14x? minus 10 or the 6 times x plus 1. Which one has to be bigger? This one does. So now I do the work. I do have to distribute. Oh, see, I switched to an equal sign, didn't I? Careful. 6x plus 6. And now we do our work. And I get 8x is less than 16, so x is less than 2. And we're all set. So watch those last two. Do not be that student. Every year I get three or four people in every class who write equal signs for everything there. This year so used to doing it. Don't be that person on those last couple problems. It even says right there, I mean, when you get the problem, circle the word inequality. Make sure you know, oh, yeah, I can't, no equal signs here. They're inequalities. All right. That's the review. Good luck tomorrow.